Today, we are going to talk about work uh, and try and develop some equations for our notions of work that are going to build from what we know from last year, uh, from our introductory course into what we're going to do in terms of the advanced topics. So a couple of things to remind ourselves. Uh, we said that work was a change in energy and that change could be in form. It could be from a uh, transfer from one object to another, and it could be a change in amount. Uh, we're going to get into that. Um, the distinction between the different types of change uh, very much in the next chapter. Um, but for now, uh, we're going to reformulate the notion of work uh, based on what we need it to say uh, in just a moment. So remember, work is a change in energy. What's, what's energy? Energy is a mathematical description of the state of an object or system that describes its capacity to affect the environment because of its motion or position. I know it's a mouthful. Uh, but that is the meaning of it. It is a mathematical description of state, meaning then work describes the change in that state then, a change in that capacity. So a couple of things. If it's a mathematical description of state, it's going to be a number that describes capacity. And this is something we did not emphasize before, but we need to emphasize now. Energy and work are scalar quantities. And actually, that from a mathematical perspective is the most important thing I can say, is that they are scalar quantities. What does that mean? It means that number does not have direction. That number is merely an expression of capacity. Okay. So knowing that that is true, that energy and work are scalars, we're going to get to deeper reasons why we need those to be true uh, in the next set of chapters when we talk about momentum, um, we're going to just keep that presently in mind because it's really important for the mathematical ideas of what's going to happen. Let's get back to the notion of work. We said work is a change in energy, but if energy is a description of state and work then is the change in that state, well, what is it that does change? And that is where we're going to get the notion of force because we know that force is our agent of change. Forces act in order to cause change. And not all forces cause change, right? Um, but forces in isolation, a single force acting on something will always cause change because if there's only one force acting on that thing, then that is the net force and then that object accelerates, i.e. change, okay? So we're gonna describe work as the action of a force that attempts to change the energy state of an object or system, okay? So it's a little bit more than just a uh, change in energy. So the number that goes with work will be the amount by which the energy has changed, right? Whether that's the amount of energy transferred, transformed, added to a system, removed from a system. That's what the number is going to mean. Um, but I do want to get into the to our definition, the notion that uh, when uh, that has to be a force that is doing this. And those attempts to change, meaning not all forces do work, number one. And two, when a force does work, it doesn't necessarily mean that a system is going to change the state of its energy, right? Because there could be other forces doing work that are preventing that change. And so there could be an equilibrium going on there. So trying to bake that all into the pie of the definition. So there we go. So let's just talk about some simple concepts, right? Uh, and we'll just use an easy example, something that we should have seen last year. So if I have a box that's being pushed to the right by an applied force, um, and let's, let's just call that FA, and let's say that uh, there's a kinetic friction force here acting, um, that there is a normal force, and there is a force of gravity acting. A nice simple example. And we'll just say here for sake of argument that the applied force's magnitude is greater than the force of kinetic friction, just for sake of argument. And let's say that when we encounter this object in this state, it is initially moving forward with a certain velocity of uh, vi. Okay, well, forward, moving to the right. So we know from all of our experience here that this system will speed up right? Uh, because there's going to be a net force to the right, meaning an acceleration to the right. Anytime your acceleration is in the same direction as your velocity vector, that object speeds up. 
right? But if we consider it independently, the action of the applied force is attempting uh, to change the energy state of the system or object. Very specifically, how? Well, we know that one of the um, descriptions of state is due to its motion. This object, this force is trying to speed up that object, meaning it's trying to increase its kinetic energy, right? This force here is trying to decrease that, uh, that description of the energy state of the object, right? It's trying to slow the object down. But neither the normal force nor the force of gravity is really acting in such a way that it's going to change the motion of the object, right? We know that these two forces are going to be equal and opposite to each other because if we do a net force equation in the vertical direction, that's going to be the mathematical conclusion of that. So neither of these forces are acting in such a way to attempt to change the state of the object. This is trying to increase the capacity of the system to affect the environment by increasing its speed. And this is trying to decrease the capacity of the system. So with all that being said, how is it that we um, calculate work? How is it that we look at what's going on? Well, let's go to what I hope you learned last year. Hopefully you learned last year that the equation for work was that work was equal to force times displacement times the cosine of theta. Now, we'll get back to, well, we'll get back to it. Well, well, let's talk our way through this. First, force. Yeah, the action of a force to cause change in the state of the system or the object. If there is no force, there is no work. work uh, force is the agent of change, right? Now, why displacement? Well, if you think about this, in, in a way, if I push on the wall, it doesn't matter how hard I push, the energy state of the wall is never going to change. I would only know that the wall um, changed its energy state if it started moving, i.e. if it underwent a displacement. So in that way, displacement is going to become a sufficient um, uh, evidence for the fact that the energy of that system could change, right? If I'm holding my phone here, I'm exerting force upwards under the force of gravity downwards. This thing is not experiencing a change in its state, its energy state. If I then lift it upwards, because it underwent that displacement, I now know that this thing has a greater capacity to affect the environment, right? So once again, displacement here um, by raising it up was good evidence that there was work done, that the, the, the capacity of the system to affect the environment changed. When I'm throwing something to the side, right, that displacement that it undergoes, right, in which it, it's changing its motion during that displacement, specifically speeding up, is also good evidence that that force is doing something to affect the state of the environment, right? So those are the notions that we want to keep in our head. And so you should have learned this last year. So let's say that this object uh, we know is going to displace to the right. Uh, let's say it displaces, um, you know, x this amount, right, for, for, for the given time. Or rather, we're only concerned with it up to this point, and then we could talk about it, what happens after that point in terms of uh, a problem, okay? So what do we have here? Here's the force. Here's the displacement over which that force acts. What on earth is theta? Well, theta is going to uh, be what's going to be the most important part of this equation um, because of the fact that this is a scalar quantity. So first, let's get back to this because force we know clearly is a vector quantity. Displacement is a vector quantity, but uh, work is a scalar. So how does this operate? Well, easy enough. What you learned last year is that you were dealing with magnitudes here. Force times displacement times cosine of theta. That's hopefully what you learned. Now, what you may also have learned is that work is equal to the magnitude of the force times the distance, right? Um, now, that, that, that might be true, uh, but that has problematic uh, portions as well. Uh, if it was a little bit better, you would learn that this is the distance uh, parallel, meaning the distance along the same axis as the force, I don't like that phrasing really either because distance along an axis is problematic because distances are scalar quantities. They don't like happen along axes, but sometimes you'll see this version as well, or you'll see more rightly uh, force parallel 
um, times the distance because you can have a force parallel to something. But then again, once again, it can't really be parallel to a distance. A distance is not a vector quantity. Problematic. So uh, these might be uh, some things you learned. We're just going to put them off to the wayside for now. So force displacement cosine of theta. Theta. What is theta? Well, theta is going to be the angle between that force and the displacement vector when drawn concurrently. So for example, uh, if we're talking about the applied force, there's the applied force, there is the displacement, theta here is zero degrees. Uh, for the frictional force, we'll call it K, uh, we know that here is the frictional force, here is the displacement, theta would be 190. Uh, for the normal force, here is the normal force, here is the displacement, uh, Actually, I'll call this theta A, F, uh, theta K, theta N. This is going to be 90 degrees. And then, whoops, I'm off the... And for gravity, uh, if I draw that little FG, delta S, theta G is going to be 90 degrees. And so that has some implications then in terms of this equation. So if you notice them, what's going to happen here is um, if theta is equal to zero, then cosine of zero is one. Um, this is going to come out positive, so work comes out positive. Uh, K, 180, uh, the work, well, work A, work K is going to come out negative, and then work of the normal force is zero, and the work uh, done by gravity is zero, and you can see um, that we get exactly what we talked about before. If work is a change in energy, a change in the capacity of the system to affect the environment, the action of the applied force is attempting to increase. So that's what positive work means, increase, right? Not to the left, to the right, but an increase in amount, right? So this is trying to increase the energy of the system. This is trying to decrease the energy of the system. And these are not trying to change the energy of the system. There you go. That's along the lines of what you should have learned last year. But we're gonna we're gonna make this a little bit better. But for now, it's a pretty damn good equation. And when we're doing this, um, just so that we're being really clear, I'm gonna put always subscripts. So this, if this is the work done by an individual force, um, this is that individual force, and this is the angle the individual force makes with. Um, uh, the displacement. You'll notice that I don't put a subscript on delta S because the displacement of the object is the displacement of the object, right? And once again, I do want to uh, emphasize that this displacement is a displacement over which that force acts. For example, let's say I go this far, right, this dividing line, and when it gets to this point, um, the applied force goes away so that the frictional force then is the only force along that direction that's acting and then it comes to a, a rest somewhere over here. I'll call it uh, delta S1, the delta S2, right? So um, we know V is equal to zero here. When I'd be using this equation, even though I would only be using FA over this space, I would be doing um, the action of FK over that amount of space. So it is the displacement over which that force acts um, and so that might not even be the same for all forces. Now, last year in problems you did, it was, uh, but we're going to a greater degree of sophistication this year, right? So this is the basic notion, hopefully, of what you saw about work last year. Um, so before I uh, uh, go forward, I also want to show you the other thing that hopefully you saw last year as well. So now I have all of these works. Well, what I can do is I can combine them together into something we're going to call the network. And that's going to be equal to the sum of all the works. Nice and simple idea there. Now, here's the glorious thing about this idea, right? Notice that these forces all occur on different dimensions, right? If this thing was on a slant, then I would have even more weird stuff going around, but I wouldn't care about it. The nice thing of work being a scalar quantity is that they're just numbers. They're just additions and subtractions, right? Increases in energy and decreases in energy. So if I'm adding them up, I don't care what direction that force acts because the work equation reduced it to a scalar number that described its, uh, whether it was increasing the energy or decrease the energy. And then all I need to do is add up increases and decreases. So if we want to think of this in a business sense, work net is like your your profit, right? And so I would just add up all of my revenues and then my uh, my costs would be negatives, 
and uh, revenues plus costs is the net is the net amount of money, right? And so if I have more revenue than costs, I end up with a positive network, meaning a total increase in the energy in the system over these changes. If I end up with a negative work, that just means a decrease. And if I end up with a work of zero, network of zero, that means that there's no change in the total amount of energy from the beginning to the end of this change process, which oftentimes happens, okay? So network. Um, but what you hopefully also saw last year was the following. Network is equal to, well, if I follow along the pattern of what I had before, that is gonna be the magnitude of the net force times the displacement of the object times the cosine of theta for um, the network, or rather between the net force and the displacement, okay? Um, and hopefully you saw something like this, right? Um, network is equal to ma, and I'm gonna get rid of the, the magnitude signs just now for um, sake of argument. And actually, you know what? Also in sake of argument, let's say that there's a zero degree angle between the network and the or the net force and the displacement, just so that I can put in a, a one there. And this is very kind of hand wavy in terms of uh, what's going on. I totally recognize. But once again, uh, oh, actually, you would have this year we're using net force. There we go. Um, but we're going to do this a little bit more formally in a better way in, in a couple of minutes. So there we go. Um, yeah. And so Hopefully then you remember uh, an equation and that equation that you remember was VF squared is equal to VI squared plus two A delta S or maximum height equation. Uh, and if you notice A delta S is equal to um, one half V final squared minus V initial squared. And then I can put that in here and I would end up with one half M V final squared minus one half M V initial squared. And then that was equal to network. And therefore, the sum of all the works was equal to one half mvf squared minus one half mvi squared. And then we take a look at that uh, term. And we say to ourselves, okay, that's interesting. Um, vf squared, um, that's going to be that's 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 going to be a scalar, right? Because once you square something, you kind of get rid of the signs on something. Um, mass is always positive, right? And so these term or this term one half mv squared, um, what we're going to do is look at that and go like, oh, okay, well, that yields a scalar number that describes, well, the more massive something is, the greater the number is, the faster it's going, the greater the number is. Okay, well, it's almost like it generates a number that describes um, in a scalar way, uh, the larger it is, um, oh, how much, you know, impact that can have or effect that can have um, if that object with that speed and that mass were to affect something, right? And that's why we're going to label this thing or define this thing as the kinetic energy, right? It just seems to serve all the purposes of what we said with the capacity of an object to affect the environment uh, due to its state of motion, right? That equation seems to capture everything that we would want in such an equation. It's scalar, it's affected by mass, it's affected by speed. Notice it's not affected by direction. The degree to which something um, can affect an object if it interacted with it. it has nothing to do with the direction it's going, but just how fast it's going, right? So that is rightfully a speed and not a velocity, um, right? Now, whether you care about it and it interacts with you, well, that's a different question, but that's not the question that energy is answering. Energy is saying in that state uh, that one, like some sort of hypothetical one would care about. And therefore we would get that the network on something is equal to, uh, well, that's gonna be the final kinetic energy. That's the initial kinetic energy. So it's the change in kinetic energy. We're gonna box that. And we're actually gonna call this the work energy theorem. And the work energy theorem is the primary way in which we're going to do problems in chapter seven, right? It is the locus of all uh, problem solving. And so if you're wondering, uh, chapter seven, how am I going to do the problem? And you don't think, let me use the work energy theorem. You are most likely wrong. Or the problem is just so simple that it doesn't require this. But this is the way forward. And this is great because it says between two points in space, A and B, that all I need to know is the speed at object B and the speed at object, or speed at object, the speed at point A and the speed at point B. And then I can figure out something that's happening with the forces as it moves from here to here. Or if I'm at state A and I know everything that's going on with forces, I can predict what's going on at state B, 
beautiful. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, little uh, uh, tool. Now, a couple of you are probably saying, well, um, there's a lot of assumptions made in there uh, that are not good. First, I assumed a theta of zero. Well, let's just look and see what happens if theta was actually 90, right? Uh, that would just mean that this side would collapse to zero and um, um, that would just mean my net force is perpendicular to my displacement. Oh, yeah. Well, if the net force is perpendicular to displacement, the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity, in which case there's no change in speed. Oh, if kinetic energy is based on speed, therefore I would end up with a, um, a, a sigma do, uh, W of zero, no change in kinetic energy. That's actually true. That works. If this was 180, uh, then this would come out negative. Uh, sort of have a negative delta ke oh yeah well if the net force is opposite the displacement um that is going to slow down so actually this works so don't worry about my randomly choosing uh theta to equal zero now someone else is going to say hold on a second Vaughn. look at that that's a problem too because that use of kinematics in this derivation assumes that the acceleration is constant right because that's the condition for which uh, this equation is true. What happens if I have a variable force like um, a resistive force or the spring force or the gravity force or something acting in, in, in between those two points in space? And, you, and, and to you, I'd say you, you'd be right, except I'm going to rederive all this with calculus. We're going to come to the same conclusion. Um, but this is what, once again, what we presented last year to you. So once again, two things you learned last year, work is equal to force, magnitude force, magnitude displacement, cosine theta. Thing two, work energy theorem. Boom. Done. Great, now let's move it forward. Now we have more skills. So I have force and displacement. So have we seen something like that before? Let's go back to the structure there. Magnitude of one vector times magnitude of another vector times the cosine of the angle between them. And we have two vectors being multiplied and getting a scalar. Hopefully with that, the calls for you is the dot product because that's what the dot product does. If I have vector A and dot vector B, that gives us magnitude of A, magnitude of B, cosine of the angle between A and B, and we prove that. So that's the same structure as what we go on, what we have going on here. You'll also rem remember that's the same thing as doing AX times BX plus AY times BY plus AZ times BZ, multiplying the components of those things. Brilliant, right? So that's the structure of what we had before when we studied dot product. And the same thing is going to be true here. But in this case, what I'm multiplying together here is really work, not work, oh God, that's terrible. Work is equal to the force vector dotted with the displacement vector, okay? And so this is a more sophisticated way of looking at the work equation. So what does that do? Well, it gives us the same result of what we had before. I get force, I get our magnitude of force, magnitude of displacement, cosine of the angle between those two. Um, so, so there we go. But what that also tells me is I have fx delta x plus fy delta y plus fz delta z, right? And that should jive with what we talked about before. Right, we know that if an object is moving horizontally, the gravity force is not going to do work. And that, that's shown really nicely here because if I'm moving horizontally, my delta y is zero. So no force in the y direction would ever do work if I'm moving perfectly horizontally. Beautiful. So like a lot of these notions are, um, are gelling together. Now, I do want to say something about this form of the work equation, just to be really clear. If I'm using this form of the, the, the work equation, I, there's an assumption I'm making, and the assumption is that I am writing my force in IJK notation, right? So remembering this notation from before, and I'm writing my displacement in IJK notation as well. So that's delta X I hat plus delta Y J hat plus delta Z K hat, okay? And there's a couple of things to remember for using this. One, the meaning of i, j, and k hat are fixed, right? You're not tilting anything, better not be tilting anything. Positive i is to the right, positive j is up, 
and positive K is off the page. Okay. You have no choice. Oh, I'm sorry. That's off the <laughs> Speaking off the page. Um, you have no choices in the matter if that's the way that you're defining your system. Now, we're going to be sticking with two dimensions here. So let's not worry too much about delta, about uh, the K hat. But I to the right, J hat uh, up is positive. And you would have to put your forces into this form and you have to put your displacements to this form. So if I have a, a force that acts to the left, um, I would have a negative coefficient here. If I had a force that acted down like gravity, I would have a negative coefficient here. And I would have to plug in those things. Notice I have the magnitudes here because that's the magnitude of these vectors. So just to write that, remember magnitude of a three-dimensional vector is just doing this. Here you're seeing the magnitude bars, right? Delta X squared plus delta Y squared uh, plus delta Z squared, right? There you're seeing the magnitude bars to get rid of the directionality. Who cares if it's left or right? Just those components. Um, so that would be here. That would be here. Here I would have to be using signs when I plugged in. So there's just certain conventions. So there you go. It's another way of looking at the work equation. And it gets us to the same result of what we had last year. So why the two different forms? Well, just in higher level physics, um, you're more actually likely to, um, to find your forces given in this form and your displacements given in this form. So having this in your back pocket is a really nice thing. If you're given the magnitudes and the force and the displacement, this is a really nice thing, right? So um, there you go. So we want to just be able to move that forward uh, to a, a better type of notation and recognize, well, how am I getting from multiplication of two vectors to get a scalar? The dot product is really the thing that does that for us, right? Um, in fact, the dot product is pretty much invented in order to do this. There, the, the concept of energy requires um, vectors involved and yielding scalar quantities. The whole point is to reduce the dimensionality of the idea to make these things easier to deal with. Boom, um, scalars are much easier to deal with than vectors. So there we have it. Good. Moving on, the next level of complication. Because what happens if I have forces that are a function, right? So what happens if my force here, right, that is acting is a function of position? I don't know. Maybe the force is the spring force, which has, so I'm attaching this to a spring, right? So this thing has an equation of negative kx i hat. Boom, that's the spring force. Yes? Um, the further and further I stretch it from that equilibrium position, if that's x equals zero, the stronger and stronger and stronger, actually the spring force would then be acting in this direction. Sorry, spring force, but maybe I have some sort of applied force in this direction. Not as silly, right? So that force changes over position. The problem is, this equation doesn't account for that, right? So how would I account for the changes in force over position? Well, we want to think of this another way. Let's go uh, back to our work equation. Force dot delta s. I'll uh, chop this up. Like, let's say I'm stretching my object out to this position here, some sort of x final. Um, I would say the spring over, you know, this displacement um, you know, it's getting bigger in terms of magnitude. And in this one, it's getting bigger. This one's getting bigger. This one's getting bigger. So for each displacement, that force is bigger. So if I wanted a better answer to this, what I could do is like say, okay, well, over this displacement, roughly how big on average is the force here? And then chop it into this section because the force is bigger here over this displacement. Those displacements are equal. So I can kind of like figure out, okay, how big is it here? 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 All right. Um, oh, you know what would be better? If I just considered uh, the smaller displacements, right? Because uh, there'd be a, a, a smaller range of forces if the displacement is smaller, right? Because that's growing as X grows. Hopefully you see where this is going. Well, if I want a better approximation, well, I make the displacement smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller that I'm considering this. And eventually, if I make it really, really small, I just want to add up all the little bits of work that are done over each little bit of displacement, hopefully you see where this is going, um, that I would actually need to do an integral. And that integral is doing f dot ds now. 
and there it is. That's actually um, the definition of work. Okay, in a calculus notion, it is indeed an integral. I'm adding up the, in, the, the force that exists at every individual point in space times the next little change, the point in space change, times the next little one, times the next one, and then adding up all those contributions of all of those energy changes, right? So now this is really complicated and annoying to use. If I have a constant force, right? I'm pretty much going to use this equation. And even, not even this way, this is even complicated to use. If I have a constant force, it's a really easy problem. I'm just going to use a magnitude of the force, magnitude of the displacement, cosine of the angle between them. In fact, this is the most uh, uh, where you should start, right? Then if you're given forces and displacements in IJK, we might go to that other definition. If you have much more complicated things, um, you might want to start here. And then if and only if the force is variant, we would go here, right? Don't use the sledgehammer if sometimes a finer tool works, right? This is the simplest tool. We want to use this tool where it's where, uh, for the most part, we know that we have this definition and then we have this better definition, right? But in terms of problem solving, having a definition is not the same thing as doing a problem. So I want to just... Um, uh, go back to that last thing or that earlier thing that I was talking about before in terms of a derivation of the work energy theorem. So here, if I want to take the network, that would be the net force, or I would say sigma f uh, dot with ds, right? And then I know that I can just do a sigma f dot ds. Well, sigma f is just ma dot ds, right? And what's A? Well, A is dv dt dot ds. Now that's not very helpful, right? So what am I going to do there? Well, maybe I try a different substitution, integral of v dv dx, right? Or really ds dot ds. Oh, and hopefully you see what happens there. The ds's go away. And just so I don't have to go onto a new piece of paper, what I'm left with here is the integral of mv dv is equal to the network. And then uh, if I uh, take that integral from vi to vf, I'm willing to put some limits on that now. Uh, actually, we won't say vf. We'll just say to some random v. Um, I think it's pretty clear this becomes that the network is one half m v squared evaluated between v i and v and i still end up with one half m v squared minus one half m v i squared and i get to the same work energy theorem place and i did not make a single assumption about my acceleration being constant right so there you go that is um our journey from what we did last year with work all the way through into the more calculus -y notions and just because we have more calculus -y notions doesn't mean we want to use them, right? We only care about the calculus stuff if the forces are variant over time, over space, over velocity, and then we're gonna come to this and then we may have to do some, some uh, transformations in order to make this, this usable, but uh, that's what it is. So in class on Tuesday, we're gonna do some very simple work energy theorem type problems and then expand outwards from there. Uh, and in fact, uh, I kind of previewed something that we're going to be doing later in the week when, uh, when we're back together in class together. We'll start looking at the spring force and the work done by the spring force, the work done against the spring force. Um, and I'll, actually, I'll just do one last thing, right? So if work is an integral, hopefully what you're realizing that if I plot the force times the, uh, the displacement here, um, right, so that's that that this area here is equal to the work done by that force because that's just true for any uh, integral, right? So just kind of throwing that out there. Great. And there we go.